Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 12 of my KSB ca campaign. And this here is Muna 3. Now, you might recall last episode, I launched Muna 3 um, and set it on a course for the moon, but then abandoned it and went on to do some other things while it made its way out there. And you can see now we're in the moon's sphere of influence and we're getting ready to do our capture burn. Um, the plan here is to land on the moon. This will be our first thing, landing on a foreign body and going to be returning back to Kerbin with our science booty. Um, you can see here that with the solar panels, uh, I kind of angled them because I knew it would be sitting on the surface and the sun might be above it. So I wanted it to be able to have the sun above it and still be able to c collect enough sunlight to be able to operate. Um, and I did that using the new editing commands that are in the VAB and, and space plane hangar, uh, the new rotation and translation commands. And yeah, I gotta say, I really like them. I stuck the batteries underneath the solar panels just to make it look like they have some sort of support. So anyway, the plan here is to get ourselves into a low Kerbin orbit, or a low Kerbin orbit, I mean a low lunar orbit. Um, and then from there, sort of decide upon where our landing spot is going to be. And then we're going to get ready for our descent. So we'll cut on down to the completion of our circularization burn. The one thing I didn't put on this thing were any lights. That was just a complete oversight on my part. And we'll take a look at our orbit. And then it's time to start thinking about um, where it is that we want to come down. And we definitely want to come down on the near side, the side facing Kerbin, so that we have a communication link. And as you can see here, it worked out pretty well. We have a, we have a, the near side mostly illuminated, so that'll be good. We'll, we'll end up landing in the light. I wasn't going to land this thing in the dark anyway. Uh, if, if it came down to that, I would have just hung around for a few days and let the right side of the moon end up in the light. Uh, and I think for my landing site, I'm sort of eyeing that kind of high plateau area towards the... Uh, west side of the moon right now. I think that's going to work pretty well for me. Um, I do have a, uh, a, a communication link, but when I get into the far side of the planet, there comes a good chance that I might end up losing that communication link. Um, I do have a couple of satellites in lunar orbit which may act as relays, uh, but they're never designed to be anything like that, so if it works, it just works. And in fact, uh, the one that's in the polar orbit really is at too low an altitude to be of much use, and the other one just isn't positioned right to be that good. So most of the time that I'm on the far side of the moon, I end up being in the dark. Or not in the, in the communication shadow. <laughs> well, in the dark sometimes too. And as predicted, I lose that communication link. So I, I warp around, uh, do a complete orbit, and I'm going to go try this again. If I want to land in the uh, those little highlands there, I'm going to need to burn eh, probably maybe about a third of an orbit before I get to where it is I want to land, something like that. You want to get your descent in to be pretty shallow, so you just bring your periapsis down. So here I get the communication link, but I, I, I think I'm really too close. I'd like to be a little further away than that. So I'm going to go around one more time. One thing you might be noticing as I'm going around is um, the data that is up there at the top left corner. That is Kerbal Engineer. It turned out all this time I had the .25 version of Kerbal Engineer, the old version, still installed and uh, suddenly realized that I don't have the .90 version. So I got the .90 version and the... Uh, the look of it, I think, vastly improved. It's a much less obtrusive. And you're going to see that data moving around a little bit as I start to get it into the places that I want it to be. And seeing that I'm about to lose the communication link, I decide to go for the descent burn anyway, even though this isn't the ideal spot. So what you do is you just burn a little bit retrograde, the idea of bringing that periapsis just down to about the surface. And once I did that, I start to realize, well, no, 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 I'm, I'm not getting to where I want to be. I'm going to end up in that crater there. So I turn around, burn a little bit prograde to raise my periapsis. The idea here is to come in on a shallow descent, and ideally, you probably want to be about like a kilometer, kilometer and a half or so. It all depends on how brave you are, but being up a kilometer, kilometer and a half gives you some uh, some wiggle room and some room for error. So that's what I like to be, about a kilometer and a half above uh, 
the, lo the your landing location, and then you can do your descent from there. And shortly after setting up that descent, I do lose my communication link, so I'm warping around the back side of the moon, hoping that Kerbin shows up soon, because the worst thing in the world would be to not have communication and end up hitting the ground and not being able to do anything about it. But... Ah, there it is. There's there's Kerbin. So the communication link pops in, and then Kerbin rises just very shortly after that. And uh, that, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. So zipping over the far side crater, I'm keeping a very close eye on my altitude above the terrain, which right now is well over three kilometers, but... You know, I, I am I am descending fast, and I can see this this ridge at the edge of the canyon coming up, and I'm wondering about you know how how, how much am I going to clear this? So I figure you know maybe maybe the best thing to do would just be to put this thing down sooner rather than later. So I turn myself retrograde, getting ready to do that final descent. So the idea here is to keep an eye on the horizontal velocity and to just start burning with your pitch right at zero for now. I want to kill that horizontal velocity and get myself falling as close to vertical as I can. Now the one thing I do have to worry about is I am falling at the same time and I do want to, oh wait, that lower stage just died. So. We, uh, we get rid of that and keep burning with our lander. That lower stage now is in a suborbital uh, trajectory, so it will crash. I am a little bit worried about that ridge that I'm coming up on, so i got to make sure that I do clear that and still give myself some time. So I pitch down maybe a little bit more. I guess I'm pitching up, but burning down a little bit more than I otherwise would. And again, watching that horizontal, I don't want to drop too quickly because I can see now I'm not that far away from the actual surface of the moon and I don't want to hit it while I'm going sideways. But my velocity is largely killed and we keep thrusting along that retrograde vector. It's looking pretty flat under me so that's pretty good. And we're falling. Uh, to be honest I probably killed more of my velocity, vertical velocity than I would have liked to. I would like to be falling um, more quickly than this. I just got a little freaked out by that ridge and also I'm a little bit messed up because of the different Kerbal engineer. It takes me a second to always look over there and see what the numbers are. But what you want to do is you want to keep that retrograde vector uh, up at the top of the nav ball. So you sort of uh, keep want to keep that horizontal velocity pretty much at zero. You also want to um, not burn until you have to. The more burning you do on your descent, the uh, the the less uh, uh, fuel you're gonna or the more fuel you're gonna end up burning. But this is looking just just about perfect here, and yeah, touchdown and a nice slow speed. And I can see it. it ew, I am on a bit of more of an angle than I wanted to, but that's okay. We're down. So gotta just do us some science. Um, you probably heard that little little blurp. That's the uh, science al alert mod telling me that there's science for me to do. Uh, I just installed that thing because I got, I got a little bit tired of missing some science, and this, this seems to simplify things. Though here, what it is you need to do, I think, is pretty obvious. Though I did transmit some of the science just to fulfill the contract requirement of, of sending in some science from the surface. This is just in case I end up losing this thing on my descent back to Kerbin. I would hate to have all the science on here and then not fulfill the contract just because uh, I ended up messing up my re-entry. And with our science gathered, it's time to head on home. You always want to take a moment to kind of orient yourself. You want to, just like when you take off from Kerbin, you want to burn towards the east because that's the direction in which uh, the moon rotates just like every other body in Kerbal uh, space program. And th the way you ascend, it, it's not all that different from a normal launch except you don't have to worry about the atmosphere. So you pitch over pretty much right away and, uh, and head off at 45 degrees and then just kind of keep following you know, a little bit above that prograde vector. Um, and you're watching your apoapsis. You want to get the apoapsis at around 12 kilometers for the moon. That will make sure that you clear any mountains or anything that's hanging about. And then once you get the apoapsis up to 12, you kill your engine, you coast up to apoapsis, and just like when you try to get an orbit around Kerbin, uh, as you approach apoapsis, you start to burn prograde to uh, bring your periapsis up to about 12 kilometers as well, and then you are in orbit. And 
with that, accomplish its time to plan our return. Now remember the moon is moving around uh, in a prograde direction, so you want to burn so that your trajectory goes opposite to that. So you place your maneuver node on the leading edge of the moon and you start to burn prograde away from that. And it takes a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of playing around. And what I find really helps, especially, well, you can see I'm using precise note as well. That's one thing that really helps me out. But what I like to do as well is to select um, Kerbin as my target. And then I can really take a look at where that periapsis is and want to get that periapsis down into the atmosphere, just as I did when I did that uh, flyby of the moon, that man flyby of the moon a couple of episodes ago. So it's a combination of getting the timing right, getting the amount of prograde right, um, and uh, yeah, you want to get that down uh, into the atmosphere like I am here. And then comes time to perform our escape burn. And you can see here that it's about a 270 meter per second burn, which is about the same as what it took me to get my capture orbit in the first place, which is the way it works. The amount it takes to get a low orbit capture is the same as the amount it takes to escape again. Uh, just doing it now the other way. And then it takes very little more than that to fall all the way down to curb. And sometimes people are surprised by that. But once I'm outside of the moon's sphere of influence, it's just downhill all the way into Kerbin's atmosphere. And why don't we take a little bit of time to admire the moon as we uh, blast on out on our escape trajectory. So we'll cut to us closing in on Kerbin. And once again, I'm going to use the trajectories mod to plan my arrow breaking maneuver uh, to lower my orbit. And uh, here it, it became apparent that there was an oversight in my design. And the oversight was this. Um, the antennas. If I retract the antennas, I have no communication with this probe, and this probe becomes dead in space. I have no way to control it anymore. Yet, if I keep the antennas up, and I go through the atmosphere, I have a chance of breaking them. So, what I did, I'm going to be closing the uh, dish antenna on the side for sure, but I'm going to have to keep the communitron open. And as I was playing with trajectories, I was really paying careful attention to the predicted g-forces. And I wanted to keep the predicted g-forces under 0.2 of a g. Why 0.2? I don't know. It just it felt good. I just picked 0.2 out of a hat. Because I'm really concerned that if I start getting too much force on that antenna, it is going to break on me. Now, I could have avoided this whole situation with a little bit of work with KOS because um, I could have easily written a script, a programming script that would lower the antenna when I entered into the atmosphere and then automatically raise it again when I come out. I just didn't have the foresight to do this and this particular craft, in order to use a KOS program you have to have a computer core on your ship and this craft does not have a computer core. Now I do have one sort of a panic moment here when I suddenly realize like oh my gosh I've yet to deploy this parachute and that's a problem because if that antenna breaks off and I have no more control of it then I can't deploy the parachute and then uh, this thing is just going to plummet to its death no matter what I do. So there's a bit of a frantic here of like, oh my god, I gotta deploy the parachute, and oh, the settings are still so that it'll deploy when it's only 0.01 of an atmosphere, which means that um, the, the, the parachutes will end up breaking up, so I also have to tweak with the settings and all this stuff, and all before, um, you know, I'm all this time I'm worrying that that antenna is gonna break off, so I'm doing this pretty frantically. And, but it turned out that actually it was all okay because, you know what, the antenna survived completely fine. And as I'm coming out of the atmosphere, it's time for me to check on the trajectories mod again with the plan that, you know, I'll get up to apoapsis and tweak my periapsis for my second time around. And then I look at it and I say, well, you know, the G-forces are now only at 0.21. So I figured, oh, the heck with it. I'll just ride this around without adjustment and go for a second pass. And the second pass went without incident. And not wanting to push my luck with the antenna, I decided that, you know, keeping those G-forces around 0.2 uh, was the right way to go. So 
I went to a third pass, which also went without incident. And then by the time that was all done, uh, I had my orbit nice and low, but by this time, JunkSat7 was just about ready to roll out. So I thought what I would do would be to push my periapsis outside of the atmosphere, leave uh, this guy in orbit for just a little bit so that I can attend this other mission. Now, JunkSat7 is another one of these lunar orbit insertion missions. Uh, so I'm not going to show you the launch or the transfer burn or the correction burn because you've seen me do these things before. Instead, I'm going to cut right into this uh, me planning the capture burn because it's right around here where I realized, yeah, I had messed up. Now, before I get to my screw up, um, some of you might be wondering at this point, probably quite rightfully, is what the heck is up with all this moon love? I mean, really, you know, there are other celestial bodies in Kerbal Space uh, Program without the moon. Like, where's Minmus? Where's Eve and Moho and Duna and all the rest of it? Well, quite frankly, I have not gotten a single contract yet to go to Minmus. I would love to go to Minmus. There's no reason for me not to go to Minmus, but I haven't gone to Minmus because I haven't got a contract and. I want the money. <laughs> I'm a greedy bastard. I want that money. I want to upgrade my science facilities, and so I'm not doing anything that doesn't have a contract attached to it. I will go to Minmus soon, I promise, whether I get a contract or not. Um, I was planning a mission to go to Duna, but I just missed the transfer window. Um, to go to Duna or outside of the Kerbin system, I need better antennas than what I've got so far or what you've seen so far. And just as I unlocked that antenna, I wasn't able to build something fast enough in order to hit the Duna window. I do have, though, a Moho window coming up, so you will be seeing that quite soon. And here we're taking a look at JunkSat 7. You can see that it's got the materials bay on it. Uh, that's because the contract asked for it to have a materials bay. Uh, you can also see that I have deployable solar panels. So, yeah, my tech's moving up. I also have these small um, probe sized fuel cans, the 0.625 meter fuel cans, and yeah, so so I'm, I'm moving up the right direction with the tech tree. It's just too bad I, I messed this up. So have you seen where I've messed it up? Have you spotted the mistake yet? The mistake is, is that my burn is 436.7 meters per second. That's my capture burn, but uh, this thing only has 293 meters per second of delta V left in it. Now, 293 meters per second, I thought, should be plenty. I've done captures around the moon with only 293 meters per second. And like 436 meters per second to do this capture, and I start playing around with, oh, maybe, okay, maybe I'll just forget about the orbit, and maybe I'll just get a capture. But I can't even get the capture. I can't even get close to a capture with only 293 meters per second. And, you know, this puzzled me for a bit, and then I just realized that, I guess, you know, the further out you are away from the body, the more expensive your capture is going to be. Well, who knew? Well, to be honest, I'm sure actually quite a lot of people knew, but clearly at this time I didn't know or else I would have planned for this. And I sat there and I went over some of the numbers, uh, just very, very cursely trying to sort of get into my head about why. I think part of it has to do with, you know, the moon's orbital speed is 429 meters per second. And when you are just sort of catching the outside of the sphere of influence like I am here, um, that isn't... Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of time to match velocity with it, so you have to kill a lot of that 529 meters per second just to get a capture. Um, while if you uh, are going in into a low orbit capture, uh, you're spending more time in the sphere of influence, and so you're spending more, uh, you know, the moon's pulling you along, and you're starting to match velocities just because of that. I also suspect, though I haven't gone over the numbers, that the Oberth effect might be playing no small role in all of this, but, uh, you know, that's something I'll probably talk about later when we have a more obvious um, example of the Oberth effect in in action. But right now, yeah, this thing, I can't get a capture. And in fact, I thought, well, I'll try and deorbit it, maybe crash it in the moon. Nope, don't have enough fuel to crash it into the moon. Not at this point, anyway. I could have done it a long time ago if I realized my problem earlier. Uh, can I crash it into Kerbin? No, I don't have enough fuel to crash it, crash it into Kerbin. So this thing is destined to just kind of fly by the moon at this, this, this distance, this 1600 kilometer distance. And, um, you know, kind of orbit the orbit Kerbin for a while. Now, the one thing that is kind of nice is its orbit is still 
crossing the moon's orbit. So hopefully at some point uh, the moon will interact with it once again and if I'm lucky maybe take it off the map so I don't have to look at this particular failure again. Okay, we'll get back to Muna 3 soon enough, but uh, before I went back to Muna 3, I went back to building another Junksat 7, and, and here I am in the testing phase, so I've, 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 I've given it more Delta V, and I'm, I'm showing you this test because it, it, it's demonstrating something that I've talked about. Um, I've talked about how with Nier and with Ferrum, you have to be a little bit careful with your ascents, you have to make your gravity turns slow and gradual, and this is an example of what happens when you don't do this. Now, as you can see, I'm launching this using KOS and the problem is that I had way too much fuel or way too much thrust on those boosters I hadn't tweaked them down so I'm going up too fast so one thing there that's inefficient to go up too fast but the other thing is is that I'm gaining altitude too quickly and the KOS script that I had written adjusts pitch based on altitude so it's bringing the pitch down too fast faster than the rocket can keep up and at one point the aerodynamic pressure on that fairing starts to kick in and there it goes I can't hold attitude anymore and it starts to flip out and I'm like oh my goodness oh my goodness and thankfully you can just control C aborts the program so I aborted the program and Actually, since I had it so high in the atmosphere, I was able to regain control of it. Again, this is just in sim mode, so uh, none of this cost me anything. And I brought it back to the vehicle assembly building, of course, and got the thrust on the boosters back to where it ought to be. But I thought you might enjoy seeing that, that, that rocket kind of uh, lose control just for a little bit. And finally, we come back to Muna 3, and I decided I was going to be gentle with this one. I mean, I've had this thing in space long enough as it is, so I thought I'd do one more pass. This is arrow breaking pass number four to bring my orbit down just a little bit more so I can bring it into... Uh, for its descent as gently as I can. This is a luxury that on manned missions you don't have. Like when I couldn't do this with the lunar flyby mission that I did a couple of episodes ago because, well, they have life support and uh, they can only stay in space for so long. But with these unmanned ones, yeah, I can take my time with it and, and uh, you know, I, I want the mission to be successful. Now, the plan was after that fourth arrow breaking pass that I was going to circularize, you know, get up to apoapsis and circularize the orbit and then pick my final descent trajectory. But once I came out of the atmosphere and took a look at what trajectory was projecting my path to be, I sat there and looked at that. Again, remember that, that red dot, that's the Kerbal Space Center and that, that uh, red cross is the projected um, landing spot. I can't do any better than that. I'm, I'm going to go with that and not touch anything and just let this thing come down. So here we are entering the atmosphere for the final time. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to point, point ourselves up and eject the, the, uh, the landing gear and the fuel tanks and the engine, which is too bad. That thing had a lot of fuel still left in it. It had like something like 280 meters per second still left in it. Too bad I couldn't have transfer some of that fuel to uh, junks at seven or something that would have been nice now there is absolutely no way that that antenna is going to survive re-entry now the g-forces are just going to get too much you can see i have a heat shield on the bottom but i'm not that convinced of the aerodynamic properties of this thing um and so what i've done is i've used the flight computer to lock it on the retro gear ah, the retrograde vector so that it'll hold this attitude and even if i lose communication which will happen because that antenna is going to break off um the flight computer will still keep working and still keep holding that attitude right up until it runs out of batteries. But there's a lot of batteries on this thing. I put a couple of them, additional ones, just on top of the uh, on top of the uh, octo probe, as you can, maybe can see them. Um, so it should, it'll have enough battery power to last to the bottom. And as predicted, there goes the Communitron antenna. And when we cut to the final stages of our descent, you can see that the reaction wheels are still working. The flight computer is trying to hold it to that retrograde vector. Keep in mind, though, it is the orbital retrograde vector, so that's why it's kind of stuck on this angle. But nonetheless, uh, it splashes down without incident and is recovered normally. And so that will end this episode, and we will see you next time.